Hi, this is from Docs Upgrade. As we said in our last video, we are going to start our lecture with general anatomy, which is very important for your base and foundation to understand anatomy with ease. We will be brushing through all the important short notes, MCQs, diagrams, tables and flowcharts. The topics covered in this lecture will be sesamoid bone, types of epiphyses with example, blood supply to long bones, types of ossification, classification of joints. These are the most important needed topics to build your foundation strong and these are also the repeated question asked more often. We will be starting a lecture with sesamoid bone. So now I'll be telling you the most simpler way to remember the important points of sesamoid bone through a mnemonic, which is listening to MP3 is boring. So here you have to slash off the number 3 and replace it with the alphabet H. And here comes the mnemonic where MP3 slash H indicates that M stands for medullary cavity, P for periosteum, H for Havasian system. Crossed or 3 denotes that all these three are absent. S for synovial membrane and also denotes the surface of contact, B for bony nodules, O for ossification, R for laated. And now it will be very easy for you to remember the points. Let us brush to the important points now. Medullary cavity, Havasian system, periosteum, all the three are absent. Sesamoid bone is lubricated with bursa or synovial membrane. The surface of contact is hyaline cartilage. The bony nodules found embedded in the tendons or joint capsules. They ossify after birth and are related to articular or the non-articular bony surfaces. Now, let us discuss about its function. Its function is to resist pressure, to minimize friction, to alter the direction of the pull of the muscle, to maintain local circulation and to protect the vessels and the nerves. So now, I'll be telling you another mnemonic which will make you easier to remember the examples of sesamoid bone. So remember the mnemonic PERF where P stands for platella as well as pisiform, R stands for rider's bone and F stands for flabella. Petella is the tendon of quadricep femoris, pisiform is the tendon of flexor carpi ulnaris, flabella is the tendon of lateral head of gastrocnemius, and rider's bone is the tendon of abductor longus which is present on the professional riders. So now let us go to the MCQ session. These two are the most important MCQs which are being repeated often. Which one of the following is a sesamoid bone? So among these four options, which one do you think is a sesamoid bone? The correct answer is option C. And let us move on to the second one. Which bone acts to alter the direction of the tendon bone? Among these four options, which one do you think acts to alter the direction of the tendon pull? The correct answer is option C. So now let us move on to the second most important topic which is the types of epiphyses with the example. I will be telling you another mnemonic which is the most important one and easier one for you to understand and remember the types of epiphyses. So remember the mnemonic pact where P stands for pressure epiphyses, A for atavistic and aberrant epiphyses, C for compound epiphyses and T for traction epiphyses. So now let us discuss in detail about the types of epiphyses. Pressure epiphysis. Pressure epiphysis is articular, takes part in transmission of the weight. Examples of pressure epiphysis are head of humerus and the lower end of radius. The next one is atavistic epiphysis. It is phylogenetically an independent bone in which man becomes fused to another bone. Examples are coracoid process of scapula or strigonum, lateral tubercle of the posterior process of the thallus. The next one is aberrant epiphysis which is not always present. The Examples are epiphysis at the head of the first metacarpal and base of the metacarpal bone. The last before one is traction epiphysis. It is non-articular, does not take part in the transmission of the weight. It provides attachment to one or more tendons which exerts traction on the epiphysis. It ossifies later than the pressure epiphysis. The example are trochanter of femur and the tubercle of the humerus. The last one is compound epiphysis. Two or three smaller epiphysis joints to form compound epiphysis before the joint C shaft. The examples are upper end of humerus and the epiphysis of the head. So the process is the greater and the lesser tubercle forms the compound epiphysis with joint C shaft. So similar event is also followed in lower end of the humerus. So now let us move on to the third important question which is the blood supply of the long bone. I will be telling you another mnemonic which makes you easier to remember the arteries which are involved in the blood supply of the long bone. So remember the mnemonic neoplasm where N stands for nutrient artery, E for epiphyseal artery, 
P for periosteal artery, M for metaphyseal artery. So now let us discuss all the arteries in detail. So nutrient artery, it supplies to the medullary cavity, two third of the inner cortex and the metaphysis. It's very important to know the growing ends. So in the upper limb, the growing ends are upper end of the humerus, lower end of the radius and the ulna. In the lower limb, it is the upper end of tibia and the lower end of the femur. The direction is away from the growing end. So remember the jingle to the elbow I go and to the knee I flee which makes you very easier to remember the direction of the nutrient artery. The fate of the nutrient artery is that each branch divides into a number of small channels which terminates in the adult endophysis by anastomosing. The word anastomosing means united with the epiphyseal, metaphyseal and the periosteal arteries. The next one is the periosteal arteries which supply to the outer outer one third of the cortex. It is numerous and is found beneath muscular and ligamentaceous attachment. It ramifies beneath periosteum and enters the Volkmann canal. The next one is the epiphyseal artery which is derived from the periarticular vascular arcades. It is found in the non-articular bony surfaces. The feature is that out of all the numerous vascular foramen that is being present in that region, few admit the arteries which is the epiphyseal and the metaphyseal arteries and a larger one has a venous exit. It. The most important point is that the number and the size of the foramen, it gives a basic idea about the relative vascularity of the two ends of the long bone. The last one is the metaphyseal artery which is derived from the neighboring systemic vessels. It passes directly to the metaphyses and reinforces metaphyseal branches. Uh, this is the diagram which shows the blood supply of the long bone. Towards your left, you can see the nutrient artery in which each branch is divided into a number of channels which terminates into the adult metaphysis by anastomosing which is basically united with the epiphyseal, metaphyseal and the periosteal arteries. So on the top, you can see the epiphyseal plate which is the growing head but on the bottom, you cannot see the epiphyseal plate because it is where the fusion of epiphysis and the diaphysis takes place which shows that there is no more bone growth. Towards your right, you can see the periosteal arteries where it is numerous in nature and top of it you can see the metaphyseal artery which is derived from the neighboring systemic vessels and on the top you can see the epiphyseal artery which is basically found the non-vascular bony surfaces. Now let us move on to the next most important question which is the types of ossification. So the bone is first laid down as the mesodermal condensation. Replacement of the mesodermal model into bone is called intramembranous or the mesenchymal ossification and these bones are called as the membrane or the dermal bone. But however, mesodermal stage may pass through cartilaginous stage by contrification which happens in the second month of the intrauterine life. So the replacement of the cartilaginous model into bone is called as the cartilaginous or the endochondral ossification and these bones are called as the cartilaginous bones. So now let us move on to the next session which is MCQ. So the first question is intramembranous ossification option A begins with the cartilaginous precursor. Option B begins with the connective tissue membrane. Option C is the most common process in which bones are formed. Option D is responsible for long bone formation. So the correct answer is option B that intramembranous ossification begins with the connective tissue membrane. Let us move on to the second one. In fetal development, intramembranous ossification happens in option A, center of epiphysis or medullary cavity, option C, uh, fibrous connective tissue membrane, option D, lamella and option D, cartilage. The correct answer is option C that is in fetal development, intramembranous ossification happens in fibrous connective tissue membrane. So now let us move on to our last topic which is classification of the joint, the most important one. Joints are classified into three which is fibrous joint, cartilaginous joint and the synovial joint. Fibrous joint is further classified into three which is sutures, gomphosis and the syndesmosis. Likewise cartilaginous joint is bifurcated into two. Primary cartilage joint which is also called the synchondrosis, secondary cartilage joint which is called as the synphysis or the amphiothrosis. Synovial joint is further bifurcated into seven which is plane joint, hinge joint, pivot joint also called as the trochoid joint, condylar joint, saddle joint also called the cellar joint and the ball and socket joint. 
So now I'll be telling you another mnemonic which makes you easier to remember all the seven bifurcation under the synovial joint. It is his biceps, where H stands for hinge, S for saddle, B for ball and socket, C for condylar, E for ellipsoid, P for pivot and the plane joint. So now let us go on to the detailed discussion about the fibrous joint. Fibrous joint is joined by the fibrous connective tissue. It shows either immobility or slight degree of movement is being shown. The first bifurcation under fibrous joint is sutures which is present only in the skull. Two bones are separated by the connective tissue. The area between the bone decreases with age so that the osteogenic surface becomes opposed. The word osteogenic surface basically refers to the bony surface. So now let us move on to the examples. To remember all the four examples of sutures, there is an easy mnemonic which is pad S cube where P stands for plane, D for denticulate, S for serrate, squamous and syndialysis. Plain refers to the internasal suture, serrate refers to the interperiatal sagittal suture, squamous refers to the temporoperiatal, denticulate refers to the lamboid suture between the periatal and the occipital, syndialysis refers to the rostrum of the sphenoid and the upper border of the oma. The second bifurcation is syndesmosis, which is a fibrous union between the bones. It is represented as the interosseous ligament as an inferior tibiofibular joint. The last the third bifurcation of the fibrous joint is gomphosis, which is a peg and a socket junction between the tooth and its socket. The periodontal ligament connects the dental element to the alveolar bone. Now, let us move on to cartilaginous joint which is bifurcated into two and the first one is primary cartilaginous joint also called as the hyaline cartilaginous joint. The bones are united by a plate of hyaline cartilage because of which it is very strong and is immovable. The joints are temporary in nature because at certain age cartilaginous plate gets replaced by bone by the process of synostosis. It is seen between the epiphysis and the metaphysis of the long bone and associated with the growth of epiphysis plate and increasing length of the bone. The examples are joint of epiphysis and diaphysis of the growing long bone and sphene occipital joint. The second one is the secondary cartilaginous joint also called the fibrocartilaginous joint. The articulating surface is covered by a thin layer of hyaline cartilage. It is united by a disc of fibrocartilage and is permanent. It occurs in the median plane of the body. It permits limited movement because of the compressible pad of fibrocartilage which is seen in pubic symphysis and the manubrosternal joint. So now let us discuss about the synovial joint. Before discussing in detail about the bifurcation that comes under the synovial joint, let us brush through the most important features about the synovial joint. The articulating cartilage of synovial joint is non-vascular and elastic. It is lubricated by the synovial fluid and the joint is surrounded by an articular capsule which is made up of a fibrous capsule which is lined by the synovial membrane. This fibrous capsule is sensitive to stretches because of its rich supply of nerve. The synovial joint acts as a watchdog because it sets up an appropriate reflex to protect the joint from any sprain. So now let us move on to the synovial joint. So here is a table column which is prepared just for you and makes it easier for you to remember all the bifurcation that comes under the synovial joint. In this table column all the important features like articulating surface, movement and the examples of the joint are basically being compared. So let us go to its detailed discussion. So the first one is a plane joint. The articulating surface is more or less plane and it shows a gliding movement. The example is intertarsal joint, intercarpal joint, joint between the articulating process of the vertebrae. The second one is the hinge joint where the articulating surface is pulley shaped and the movement is seen on one plane or on the transverse axis which is the flexion and the extension. The example of the hinge joint is elbow and the knee joint. The third one is the pivot joint. The articulating surface contains a central bony pivot which is a peg and an osteoligament ring. The movement is seen on one plane around the vertical axis which is rotation only. The example is superior and inferior radio ulnar joint and the atlantoaxial joint. Fourth one is a bicondylar joint where the articulating surface contains a convex male reciprocally fitted into the concave female. 
the movement is seen on one plane around the transverse axis which is flexion extension and limited rotation the example are knee joint and temporomandibular joint the fifth one is the ellipsoid joint where the articulating surface contains an oval convex male and the ellipsoid concave female the movement is seen on both the axis which is flexion extension and circumduction the examples are atlanto occipital joint wrist joint and metacarpophalangeal joint the sixth one is saddle or the cellar joint where the articulating surface contains a convex surface which is reciprocally fitted into the concave surface and the movement is similar to that of the ellipsoid joint including a conjoint rotation so it is flexion extension and conjoint rotation the example are first carpo metacarpal joint and sphreno clavicular joint the last joint of the synovial joint is the ball and socket joint which contains a globular head which is a male and a cup shaped socket which is a female and the movement is seen on infinite axis and the example are shoulder joint and the hip joint so now let us move on to our last section which is the mcqs these mcqs the most important repeatedly asked mcqs under this topic so the first one is the joint in our elbow is an example of option a hinge option b ball and socket option c pivot joint option d gliding joint so the correct answer is option a hinge joint ball and socket joint can be seen in the shoulder and the hip joint pivot joint can be basically seen in the superior and inferior radio ulnar joint and the atlanto axial joint and uh, the option d which is a gliding joint is basically the plane joint that can be seen between the carpals question 2 Find the currently matched pairs. Fibrous joint between the phalanges. Option B, cartilaginous joint between the skull bones. Option D, gliding joint between the sagophophysis of the successive vertebrae. Option D, hinge joint between the vertebrae. The correct answer is option C, which is a gliding joint between the sagophophysis of the successive vertebrae. So, fibrous joint, as we have discussed, can be seen in the skull. Cartilaginous joint can be seen in the pubic fin surfaces and uh, in the manobrasternal joint and hinge joint as we discussed above can be seen in the elbow and the ankle the third question is the joint between the atlas and the axis option a saddle option b angular joint option c pivot and option d cartilaginous joint and the correct option is the option c so the fourth question is find the correct pair cladding joint between the carpals cartilaginous joint between the frontal and parietal hinge joint between the humerus and pectoral girdle pivot joint between the third and the fourth cervical vertebrae so the correct option is option a which is the gliding joint that's seen between the carpals and the cartilaginous joint is basically seen in the pubic symphysis and the manobrosternal one the hinge joint is basically seen in the elbow and the ankle pivot joint as we already discussed is basically seen in the superior inferior uh, the radio ulnar joint and the atlanto axial joint the fifth one is the type of joint between the skull bones option a fibrous option b cartilaginous option c synovial option d hinge so it's the option a fibrous joint cartilaginous joint and synovial hinge are already being discussed above so i hope all of you understood everything that was being taken for you in a much simpler way right now all the important short note mcqs and diagrams under general anatomy are in your fingertips so our next lecture will be starting with general anatomy all the important essay short notes and also the diagrams along with the mnemonics will be taken for you please like our video subscribe it and click on to the bell icon for you to get updated with our further lectures